Episode 003. Broadcasting live from Toronto, Canada. This is the Youth Community Culture Podcast with your host, Olu Q. Blessed love family, it's your host, Olu Q, and I am so excited to be here with you today. If it's your first time joining us, I want to encourage you to go to our website, check out our other episodes. You can visit www.oluqspeaks.com. That's www.oluqspeaks.com. We are about to jump into our second episode of our three-part series on youth justice entitled Inside Out. Today we have a special guest with us. Her name is Veronica Salvatera. She is a longtime community worker based out of Toronto with an incredible history of engaging young people. And she has with us, she has some stories to tell to us, to, to share with us. Our goal is to help you understand the issues that impact young people. And we're going to continue on from last week where we heard from another gentleman, Raymond Day, speaking about his experience as a young man growing up in social housing um, in the city and and the challenge that he faced as a young man we're going to hear from the other side people doing the work to keep young men from making those choices and i'm excited because the interview is incredible and it's going to be very helpful for people looking to figure out how we can better serve our youth populations so let's jump right into it again leave comments in the on our page Contact us, connect with us on Instagram. You can find me at OluQ Speaks on IG, on Twitter. So let's jump right into it. Let's go. What's up, everyone? It's your host, OluQ. And today I am so excited to be here with a good friend of mine, Miss Veronica Salvatera. Veronica, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. And you know what? I want to say before we start off, it is early in the morning, so I want to say a special <laughs> thank you because anybody doing community work understands that we work in the evening. So for someone to take time in the morning, early morning, to share knowledge, I am truly grateful. So again, thank you very much, Veronica. You're very welcome. So let's let's jump right into this. We're, we're doing this series on youth justice and youth violence, and I wanted to get you on to share your experience in the field you've been in this game for how many years now 18 years 18 years wow 18 years and what are some of the jobs that, that you've had in the field over those 18 years um i started as a residential counselor i'm still a residential counselor on a part-time basis uh youth justice worker um and now a youth criminal justice coordinator okay that's mm-hmm. a lot so from those jobs over the years, you know, which ones do you think have given you like the most, the most lessons? Um, I think my current role, uh, just working in, in the youth justice field outside of residential counseling, um, community based youth justice, I think is a, is a lot different. Um, when you're in residential, you, there's very hard and specific roles that you have to follow. Um, and you're very limited in what you can do. Uh, when it's community-based work, um, there's no limit to the support that you can give and the things that you can do. That's fair. So, mm. like doing the work right now within those community settings, what, like, would you say your typical day looks like? <laughs> I don't have a typical day. <laughs> there's no typical day when you're working with you. That's fair. Um, so typical day could possibly include um, emails or texts from some of my older kids who need support getting a housing letter or um, helping them with some type of application Um, it includes my current kids coming in during a crisis and needing some support or you know uh, dealing with substance use issues or suicidal ideation or, um, you know, a parent coming in with their kid who needs help 
uh, because they want a bail variation and they need support on how to get one or you know me getting called from kids saying hey so and so got arrested so um, having conversations with the police and dealing with that or it could be a, a number of things going to court talking to ministry and, and city staff it can be whatever that's a that's a whole lot of responsibility for someone to deal with every day well welcome to the world of youth work well, that's the youth <laughs> <laughs> that's what people don't know and don't see and and, th- and that's important because you know we want to make sure that people understand that you know the work that goes into supporting our young people there are people out there like veronica who are every single day taking time to engage young people in very difficult circumstances you know so again truly truly amazed by it but what are you looking at it in terms of the young people that you serve like what's the range that you're looking at when we talk youth when we're talking like age group yeah age group like how long how young are you serving and um for my work that's referred through court specifically Mm -hmm. um the young people have to be between the ages of 12 and 17 at the time of the offense for all other youth that i work with there's no limit to the age um i've worked with 12 i and i've followed them all throughout their 20s and they're still coming back to me from when they were in grade seven wow. you know so wow. um yeah i think i'm meeting this weekend with a i think she's 24 now with a kid so i mean you don't stop youth work at any age because your funders say stop you if they need support you can't just say no those are your kids they trust you for a reason so the work continues do you find that there's a sweet spot or there's an age that 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 you have to get them before otherwise you kind of don't have a chance to connect with them in, in that authentic way um no I don't think there's a a specific thing like that I think for me I I usually get them after they've been charged with a crime usually Um, sometimes young people have been charged they either continue getting charged or they you know change their minds and make a, a, a choice at that point for some of the harder ones who continue doing things it's not it's not because sometimes they want to sometimes they do but sometimes it's just hard because of the environments um that they've grown up in so it's not like they can make such changes so at certain times in their lives sometimes it's almost like they have to be pushed out of that life or they have to make a a serious concerted effort on a daily basis to keep away from that stuff Mm. so it just depends on where they're at of do i want this or not do i want to make a change that comes at any age that's fair one of the things we had and just to jump on that point that you just made about sometimes young people wanting to make change but Mm. it being challenging just because of the environment uh, we had a young man on last week, uh, Raymond Day, who was speaking about, you know, growing up in a community um, and just the influence of friends mm-hmm. and how that that played in, like that loyalty um, and how that played into some of his behaviors and choices that he made um, along the way. So from the other side, as a professional, how are you seeing the influence of friendships and community um, and loyalty, and what are some of the issues that you think are pushing young people um, to get involved? My greatest issue is mob mentality. Okay. Um, so when I talk about environments, kids who who end up um, finding a family of other young people that are, uh, you know, same age, same kind of growing up style and all that stuff um they find each other for a reason whatever that reason you know maybe mom works 20 hours a day or 
you know, they don't want to be home because stepdad's an alcoholic or whatever the reason. Young people find each other and they want to stick together. They find their own families. But then when you have, you know, a couple of them doing certain things, I can't even tell you how many times people have gotten caught up because they were with their friends when their friends decided to do something. Mm. Hmm. So you can't necessarily, or it's harder for young people to to kind of know that that young person or that friend is not being a friend if they're pulling them into stuff. But sometimes it's our inability to to leave when we know something's going to happen. And that's probably our own fear of rejection, our you know, abandonment issues, whatever it is, but you don't want to leave that family that you've built. So you kind of hang on even Mm. when it gets bad. That that's, that's a very interesting like perspective in terms of how they get caught up in it. Have you noticed or have you seen anything with young people maybe like forcing their friends into the game or you know asking them to do things that they might not feel comfortable doing is it more so that young people like they want to join or do you think there's also the other side where they're being forced into it just based on the fact that they have i don't i'm not gonna say forced i'm gonna say manipulated okay um i i see people getting manipulated to do things all the time and if I if I catch it, I'm I'm gonna stop it, and I don't have to give a reason why. I'm I'm telling you to stop whatever it is. Like if I see an older cat giving you know a twenty dollar bill to to an eleven twelve year old saying go to the store for me, I'm stopping that right there, and I'm telling that kid, yo, you need to stop doing this. So why are you saying that? Because I think there's people need to understand what would that mean what does that signify when an older cat gives a young buck 20 bucks to go to the back store it's the way i've in growing up and seeing it and you know having my brothers be the runners and doing all that stuff it it, they're testing them to see if they're going to do something for them and then each time they ask them to do something it's more and more of a test it's testing their loyalties um and then that kid that little kid who gets the you know the 17 dollars change because they bought a can of pop then yeah they're gonna want to keep doing that it's it's like dangling a carrot in front of them so it's a manipulation and then the next thing you know well go do this for me okay well i need you to bang out with this you know because this cat or whatever so um it's a it takes a while to manipulate somebody but over over time it happens all the time the young man described it as a grooming process it last is a week, grooming process saying that you know he was like looking back he can reflect and realize that yes he was being groomed oh yeah for you know if there issues yeah if um if you're 16, 17 and you're dead broke, you have no money, but you know that this cat who's you've done favors for is having a party, he's telling you to come and you get free drinks and, and weed all night. I'm I'm going to your parties too. <laughs> every chance I get. <laughs> you know, like that's, that's it's it, the manipulations can be subtle, but they're so ingrained that you don't even know that you've now become a puppet. Mm. And then things escalate pretty quickly after that. Very quickly. Very quickly. Because now you owe people. That's fair. So, like, how young are you seeing them, like, start to get into this particular grooming process? Like, what, what do you, what is that like? Grooming, I usually see around the 10, 11, 12, 10, 11, 13 12. year old age range. Wow. Um, yeah. It start like you see that that one kid who's like 11 hanging around the older guys and all the older guys are like complimenting him. Oh, this guy's this kid's bad. This, you know, yeah, he's cool. He's down. Yeah, he's that cool. kid is exactly. a writer. He's that's, this and that. That's the start. 
they're getting they're getting wow. in his head. And then, but the thing about it is that most parents probably don't realize what's happening. No clue. Outside of the home. No clue. So that's the boys. The grooming for the girls is very different. But you got to talk about that then. Like, what does that look like for the girls? Well, for the girls, it's it's making them feel like that's a little girlfriend. That that's somebody that they trust. They're going to tell them things, you know, because girls are much more emotional. And good manipulators know how to manipulate girls. So what kind of things would they be telling the girls? Like, for the boys, like, they're, sending, they're giving them money to go to the store. But oh, yeah. For, the for girls, girls, it's getting their nails done, you know, getting their hair done. It's taking them out, having them, you know, be in the passenger side of the car. And they're just there all the time. So it's almost like it's for and for a young girl, that status. Right. For a young girl, she wants to feel like she's untouchable because she's with that guy. So it's a it's a weird little thing, but much like in school, everybody want to be the popular kid. It's that's what it is. That's what youth life is. But on the streets, the consequences for being the consequences part of that are, are are nothing like a failed greater. grade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <boy laughs> nothing God. like a failed grade. That's so challenging. That's like so dealing with that, dealing with the young people, you know, watching like the game unfold in front of your eyes what are some of the things that you're doing like to engage them in terms of how do you break into the circle and penetrate like their minds to be able to engage them that that just takes time and and trust um you can't do youth work if you can't build a relationship and trust with young people that will never happen um i can say that over a long time my kids do trust me they trust me enough that when they have a problem they come to me um when their cousins have a problem they drag their cousins to come talk to me or their friends who aren't from you know the center to come and talk to me um, but that's trust. So um, it's it's been a long time, but that trust makes a lot of things happen. But if I can, please, like, just allow me to jump in because I think you're just knowing you for the last, you know, few years, you have, I've watched how young people interact with you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have many youth workers out there, but I think that you have very specific qualities that allow young people to feel comfortable around you like do you notice a difference in your approach than like other workers like what is it that you're doing differently because i see young people come to talk to you they like you said they that they're bringing family members they are telling you very sensitive information how do you allow them to feel comfortable talking to you um jeez, oh I don't know. Magic. No. <laughs> um <laughs> It actually is magic if you really break it down. <laughs> don't be don't be modest about it. It is magic to watch you perform with young people. But yeah, just but try to explore I, that. I think I think some people have an innate ability to connect with people. Um my experiences, my life experiences are very similar to these young people. And I will share stories when the time is right with who I choose to, um, which builds an extra set of connections. But because I know the game, I know the ins and outs of it all. They can't fool me. So I actually kind of tell them, hey, this is the information you've given me right now. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next. Tutus within a month they'll come back to me V how did you know that you called it <laughs> I called it I call it every time so your whole life's journey I can call it I can tell you what's going to happen if you don't make this change or if you don't do this so when they're looking for advice all I can ever do is plant a seed mm. and continue to water it every time I see them I'm going to keep pushing them I you know I'm not going to 
I'm not a yes man to, to listen to their stories and not challenge what they're going to say. I'm going to challenge them and I'm going to challenge them so that they can think critically about their lives. And that's the only way they're going to do anything differently. Have you ever been shocked, shocked by what you've heard from a young person, a story that they've told you? Have you ever been put in that spot where you had like no words or yes. you know, you're too hurt? <laughs> or um, Yeah, more than once more than once I can't say what they are but that's fair definitely more than once youth are you know some of the things they tell you sometimes you almost wish they didn't tell you like it's sometimes <laughs> it's a bit much and or a bit raw what they're saying and you're just like yeah okay just you know mm -hmm. r wrap it up a little bit nicer because <laughs> it's hard f you know I'm human yeah. I get thrown off yeah <laughs> so yeah. yeah so then when you hear those type of things i'm curious to know you know how you are able to keep yourself in a mental state that allows you to continue to support young people because that's a lot of baggage to carry around i think people don't really understand the role that youth workers play the exposure to sensitive information and having to having to directly engage sometimes that could be a lot for you so what are the things that, that you do or do you have a support system outside of the work environment to be able to allow you to keep doing the work well i'll tell you right now vicarious trauma is real mm. it's real i think it's really real when people already suffer with things um and their own experiences kind of whether you haven't dealt with them or they come back to haunt you or something like vicarious trauma is real so i would tell anybody starting out in the business um self-care is so important like that word first time i heard that word i almost laughed <laughs> i'm like self-care man what are you talking about self-care I get it now. You understand like, now? Yeah, I years so back we didn't, we didn't get that self-care. Self-care. No. <laughs> I need self-care. Yeah. Now my kids know I have more boundaries. Before, I'd get on a regular calls one, two, three, four, five in the morning. And sometimes for just unbelievable, you want to ask me a question? <laughs> you couldn't wait till I woke up or was at work? You want to call me at three... So, you know, vicarious trauma is real. I've had my own issues with it. Yeah. Um, I think we all learn how to cope with it um, because the work continues. So you continue to be affected mm. by things. But um, learning self-care strategies is so important. So important. Whatever they may be. Yeah, absolutely. In moderation. <laughs> it's a lot it's a lot to process and i'm i'm always you know just amazed at the resilience see of of our youth workers in terms of being able to to deal with all of that trauma over the years and continue to be able to to find ways to support young people to these challenges you know that's because for for some of us it's it's our calling like it's that's our purpose in life that's our passion that's where we we feel we are needed or fit in or you know is our strength whatever you want to call it if you love it then it's going to show that's fair so when you look at look at your work over the years and what you've done and and your investment into mm -hmm. young people like what are some of your success stories in terms of like your highlights things that you're proud of um I, I'm proud people of, that you've seen grow over the years i'm proud of every kid that has asked me to their graduation mm. um i'm proud of every kid who graduated who didn't think they were going to graduate or took them a couple more years to graduate i'm proud of being invited to baby showers and <laughs> you know like that or being called mom like those things make me proud because it's a respect thing you know if i mean something to you in your life then you're going to share those things with people so the fact that my kids have shared those life 
experiences with me afterwards or call me just to tell me how they're doing or come and drop by to just to see me because they were in the area and they were thinking of me for me that's a su success the fact that these they're older now and they're working and they're actually living pretty good lives those are successes to me yeah well, that's fair because i mean like we know how the work is is extremely challenging and to be able to have them come back to you after so many years on a regular and still connect with you on that's a, regular, a testimony i'll get i'll get calls regularly from older kids who just want to sit and have coffee and tell me what they're up to or you know reach out for more support because they're close to 30 and they don't know where to go so all of those things the fact that they even called me and they're they're older for me that's a success even if they need help do you ever say no <laughs> Do you ever, do you ever tell a young person, listen, no. man, I don't see the hope in you, to be honest, it's not working no. out for you. No, God, no. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't, no. Fair enough. No. I have to ask because. There's some kids yeah. where I'm just like, boy, and, and those, <laughs> honest to God, in 18 years, it's literally a, a small handful of kids yeah. that I know I'm not reaching. Like, there's, you know, at whenever they're ready to, and they choose to make a change that's on them but i know that i can't help them in any kind of way but that percentage is so small i always tell people so small over the years there's only been one or two young people i've looked in their eyes and realized that that young person is not ready or does not want to be helped ever the rest of them are asking for supports absolutely they're 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 looking at you they're talking to you they're telling you things because they want you to help them work through it yeah and and they don't know how to articulate that absolutely so when you see kids getting in trouble even if they're getting trouble in your center they're doing it purposely in your center mm. that is a safe space to have a blowout mm. so they are that's a cry for help what is going on there find out that's your job mm. um last week the young man was talking about about growing up and i guess his community didn't have uh, many resources many safe spaces to attend mm -hmm. what do you think is the value of, of having those spaces in communities for young people to attend and to be you know to be able to engage with staff well growing up i didn't I didn't go to the centers around me. They weren't welcoming to me. Okay. Um, so before you go on, what does that mean when they weren't welcoming? They because weren't. Mainly people think that community centers are spaces where you go in there and there's a friendly face. But no. What does that look like when someone is not friendly to you? Well, as as a teenager, yeah. first of all, you walking into a, a community center and catching attitude from the staff. Mm. what are you doing here or you know just being unwelcoming that runs people out i'm not coming back here forget that that's why i think th having youth spaces um in every community is so vital it's so important it's so critical because kids don't have a, a safe space to hang out they can't hang out at the friends houses because their moms don't want them there mm -hmm. nobody wants 20 kids in their in their basement <laughs> do you know what i mean Fair enough. and so hanging on the block not a good idea chances of getting shot up there's malls they get kicked out like there's no safe space for kids to hang around you know they don't own houses that they can invite their friends to so it's it's great to have a place where young people can go be themselves play games hang out with staff but with trusted adults that can help support and guide some of the things that they're doing in their lives so once you have them in and once you get them into the space mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you try to do let's say we have like a like a new young person coming to the program for the first time mm -hmm. how would you i guess try to try to get them involved first thing you do is you greet them at the door every kid that comes in the center you got to greet them they got to know that you're welcoming them in that space and it's their space um 
as time goes on like each of our kids as they come in they greet every single person in the space we've created that initial um starting point for young people when they walk through the doors they have to greet everybody because they were greeted so it's it becomes not just a routine but it's a it's almost traditional now that everybody gets greeted even if they don't know you you're getting a dabs because it's it's a respect thing in that space do you think that that most programs or communities have programs or staff sorry that have the ability to connect with like some of our more marginalized youth some of the kids who make us uncomfortable some of the kids who kind of hang out on the corner and don't really want to be engaged like what do you think is being done to address or to engage that demographic um i think more can be done the fact that uh the hardest to reach kids yeah they are listen they know systems like nobody else knows systems facts they smell fake you know um so you have to have somebody who's real working there first of all real knows real so if you don't have any like real youth workers in there then the chances of uh, flourishing are lessened um i think you know i understand with the whole eaton center you know shooting thing and the the young person who was working for the city and at the time and the whole issues with people with criminal records and and working yeah the liability with, pieces yeah the like liabilities yeah. all those things i understand that but one of the best things you can do is hire a young person who is from that community, yeah. who has been involved in things, who is respected, hiring them to be a, a support to the programs mm. in a peer capacity. Um, so I don't know why we're not pouring money into these peers who can create like wonderlands for these young people yeah. in the future that doesn't make sense to me that we're not doing that they're the ones who have the influence over the young people i'm 20 years removed you know they they think i'm i'm old <laughs> you know, i'm you're a not grandma on top, you're not on top of the couch <laughs> they, anymore yeah, in the club. exactly but they know i know what's going on and everything and they they yeah. trust me and that's all ingrained but to have a, a a younger counterpart who is from their community that they respect oh my god you'll have so priceless. many more priceless that's priceless you have so many more kids engaged yeah that's that's the the piece that i think is missing as well you know working yeah. with that demographic in terms of that like those champions who yeah. can be a voice and really like reiterate like your message in terms of you know just the following through and and trying to work to achieve uh, the most that they can but I think it's harder for us not having like that support yeah, uh, it's from like, the community but it, like how do you reach out like like, what do you do outside of your staff do you try to find a community partner or a young man or young woman who has that influence to be a part of your team in terms of we hire peers we okay. do in in my center we do hire peers um i work very closely with my peers um not just in terms of the work that we have to get done um for the project but also in terms of their lives and what's going on in their lives um whether they're dealing with an issue and they need support um i'm the go-to person so if you're gonna have peers working then you need to support them fully because you know they could be a little bit of a hot mess yeah <laughs> fair enough sometimes but, um, it's hard to make that let that crossover right yeah it's, that it's transition is, that transition is definitely you know a tough a tough road and sometimes can take longer than we expect but um they'll get there you know 
I always tell my kids, listen, I will walk hand in hand with you, but I'm not dragging you. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> if, if they want to do the work, I'm I'm w- w- ready and willing to do the work with them, but I will walk hand in hand with them. Looking back on your years, do you have that kid who has grown up from being part of the program, maybe making like negative choices like when they were younger, but now they are a part of your team and they've exceeded your expectation? I have a couple of kids like that, yeah. So what's that feel like when you, when you see them coming and just knowing their history? <laughs> How does that feel to watch that? It's pride. Yeah. It's it's a it's like a, a mama pride. I am happy, and I. It's something that I talk to them about constantly. Like at least once a month, I'll make a joke of, "Oh, I remember when you were thirteen, coming into my my court program, <laughs> you know, causing trouble, and look at you now." That's pride. You know, and that they can reflect on their life's path and their life's journey and the difficulties and then, you know, how how much the center, how much staff have helped them. Like, th- that's all I could ask for. That makes, you know, the piddly money I, I make worth it. Because <laughs> let's be real, youth workers don't make good money. Listen, that is the realest thing that's been said today. If you are looking to (laughs) live an extravagant life please choose another profession because this thing here is about young people it's about youth it's about engagement the work that we do we're not going to be retiring here no and having i'm not sitting on dubs dubs if you are if you want to be a youth worker honest to god you do it because you love it absolutely you have to love it if you don't love it please get out get out because they'll eat you up alive pretty quickly as well they'll eat you up but you're also not helping anybody Mm. you might be making it worse so if you're one of those nine to fivers who your day is done and you're not you know you you don't love what you do there's no passion in it you're scared to talk to the kids please leave this is not it for you go sell t-shirts we got we got <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no it's true you know the joke already we always laugh about yeah. you know what would we do if we weren't doing this kind of work what kind of what kind of job, job and would mine would be selling t-shirts oh. by the way. so no disrespect <laughs> to people selling shirts I admire you and I'm coming for your job you're coming for the job this okay. doesn't work out for you so doing the work like we got a bunch of parents out there that may not be aware of what's going on with their young people, with their child. Mm -hmm. What would you say to a young person who, I mean, sorry, to a parent, sorry, who believes that their child might, might be involved in something that they shouldn't be involved in? Um, well, act on it. And then would they would they would they talk to the to the kid directly? Absolutely. Or? To, well, you should always talk to your kid mm-hmm. first of all. Um, if you let a breakdown in communication happen, especially at critical times, um, in the I would say between the grade five to eight age range, um, if you let communication break down around them times, there's such critical times that. It's hard to know what they're doing because they're not trusting you to tell you. So I think just making sure that you always have an open communication with your kids. Know where they're going. Know who they're hanging around with. um, Things like that. Um, You'll see signs. I mean, we all have that you know that spidey sense that yeah, tingles the motherly when, intuition exactly the, the parent that, radar exactly yep. so we all have that trust that if you feel that going off something is up so investigate that um look for supports there are supports out there um yeah do what you can as a parent i know it's exhausting and i know you know from about 11 to 18 at least uh they can be really really hard years because young people change so drastically in them times but 
do your best. Think about that as you're talking. I'm wondering about, you know, as parents, you're watching your child, like, ha- they have friends from school, just f- kids that you've known in the neighborhood. At what point, you know, do they have to be concerned with that the friends are now a part of something larger, perhaps a neighborhood gang or some that effect? Like, how do you, how do you know the difference between, like, friendships and now this organized structure organized that we call or gang di- culture or disorganized or disorder depends or disorganized. depends on neighborhood right fair enough <laughs> um you know as a parent you know the changes in clothing in in style in in the way they speak um what they're doing their if they're schooling like you'll know something's up mm-hmm. um and that's your time to act in whatever way you feel is appropriate as a parent but you definitely need to step in in those circumstances yeah so you mentioned talking in terms of trying to talk to, but like what else would they do after they spoke to the young person and they, they didn't feel like there was there was any movement What's the next step for a parent? I, I'm I'm a fan of um, having an outside person mediate conversations. Mm. I've had to mediate conversations with young people and their parents before, mm-hmm. um, many many times, um, and sometimes it was ongoing, which was fine um, because they needed that support. Uh, but one thing I, I feel like parents fail to do just because it's it's hard is follow through. And I think that's where um, where things start falling apart if the parent doesn't follow through. Like, if you're going to threaten them with taking their PlayStation or something, you better take that PlayStation. Because if you're not following through, then that kid's just going to look at you as a joke and just going to step on anything you say. Hmm. So follow through is super important communication negotiation you have to compromise as a parent too Mm. it's not because i said so there has to be open communication that young person has to feel like they have a say in the family and what's going on so it's you know it's not days of old where parents call the shots and the kid listens and shuts their mouth no this is a different time kids want to be heard they should be heard they should have a say so it's participatory what do you think are 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 some of the issues the like the emerging issues that you see happening in youth culture young people um what are some of the things that, that we should be looking out for as parents and as community workers my greatest challenge right now is uh neighborhoodism I don't even know if that's a word. It is a word <laughs> on our podcast this it, morning. Yes, okay. it is. It, it's a word. Neighborhoodism. Neighborhoodism. Um, Explain, please. So the big thing now is everybody's a rapper. Every hood has a rapper. And if you live in or hang around in a certain hood, um, this repping of hoods. Okay through the rap music through it's not even just rap just it could be a kid in school just repping a, a hood because okay. they hang in it or or they live there this repping of hoods thing i can't i'm sorry i cannot i can't do it <laughs> let's be real nobody pays a mortgage for a house in a hood Nobody. Fair enough. Because hoods are, by and large, social Social housing, housing, government housing. So you don't pay a property tax on that. How how do you have ownership over any of that? Mm. And to take it a step further and rep your hood, for me, that causes issues because the more you rep your hood and you create enemies from another hood, the the danger level to community members in every hood Increases. skyrockets. Absolutely. It skyrockets. 
Absolutely. So that's when you get these innocent victims getting shot up. They have nothing to do with this hood beef or whatever is going on. But they're the ones that suffer the consequences because of it. So this neighborhoodism BS is it's a thing for me that I I can't and there's no safe spaces anymore. There's no more rules. Uh, there was loyalty among thieves before. There's none of that. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no loyalty. There's no, yeah, there's no mm-hmm. rules. They'll they'll shoot up a community center. They'll, they'll go stab somebody in their center. They'll do whatever. There's no rules no more. So that's what frightens me. That's That's the big change that I've seen over the last 10 years. That's heavy. Yeah. That's Rick Shumi heavy, and, and I think it's important to highlight, you know, that that there is like an escalation right now. Something's yeah. happening out there, and yeah. we're all scrambling to find answers to be able to address it. And everybody, you know, guns are cheap, and everybody want to make a name for themselves, you know? So you give a, a, a an impressionable 15-year-old gun... What do you think he's going to do? Mind you, he can't shoot for shit and mm-hmm. will probably miss and kill an innocent person. But they don't target people they the, the way they used to. Now they target a whole community, which makes no sense. What do you think that we can do as community members, um, as a collective, to support young people who are involved in this lifestyle (sighs) to support young people involved in the lifestyle well they should always have a hand willing to help them when they're ready because we don't know when they're going to be ready you know um, it could be when they're pushing 30 years old it could be in their mid 20s but if they have closed doors all around them, then they're just going to continue what they're doing. Mm. But if you continue to open doors for them or say there's an opportunity here or give them an option, you know, then that's planting a seed. And hopefully something grows out of it. Wow. Wow. Incredible, Veronica. I'm just really grateful for you taking the time today to share with us. This is uh, a lot of a lot of value bombs being dropped here. A lot of a lot of important information that you're sharing with the audience, and I want to thank you for shedding some light on these issues from a youth service professional perspective. Mm-hmm. No problem. Um, so we're gonna look out for you. Do you have any social media that we can contact you on? Are you on any social media? Man, people people want to contact you. Too. Social media. <laughs> well, listen, send a dove. Tweet send tweet. a dove across Lake Ontario, and you'll reach Veronica. <laughs> um, and we'll have a li- we'll hopefully we'll have a link or some type of contact information for Veronica on our site. Veronica, again, thank you so much. For being You're welcome. Thank you.